Welcome to the Devin Nunes Podcast. Breaking through the political noise, separating fact from fiction. From the San Joaquin Valley, the breadbasket of the solar system. Here is your host, Devin Nunes. Welcome back to the Devin Nunes Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We're back again on YouTube. Thank you for all of you who subscribe to my new YouTube page. And of course, thank you for those who continue to listen on my podcast on, on iTunes and elsewhere. This uh, week we have back on Dan Kish, who I call Dan the Oil Man because he knows everything there is to know about the oil and gas industry. He worked in Washington, D.C., is currently at the Institute for Energy Research. He spent his whole life studying uh, oil and gas and how it relates uh, to the economy and is a policy expert in this. And uh, Dan and I served together. He was the senior advisor on the Resources Committee in Congress. Uh, So I worked with Dan for a long time on all of these energy issues. So Dan, the oil man, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Congressman. Good to hear your voice. Well, Dan, what I want to do is I want to walk everyone through, just give a little primer. We've done this before, talking about where where the world's oil comes from and then where U.S. oil comes from. So could you walk our listeners through where the oil, the current high producers uh, in the world come from, because the United States, just over the past couple of years, we became the world's largest oil producer. And what we're going to do for our YouTube uh, viewers, they'll be able to see this, but I'm going to put up a story on the screen from the U.S. Energy Administration. So it's a government agency that goes through some of these numbers so folks can go to read that uh, when they have time. But Dan, why don't you walk us through who are now, starting with the United States, who are the world's top oil producers? Yes, uh, as you correctly pointed out, the U.S. has become the world's number one producer of both oil and natural gas. Uh, We're also the largest consumer. It's what makes our small population able to outcompete even China. And behind us are the Russians and the Saudis, they sort of switch positions back and forth, but much more of their oil is used for export into world markets, China, Europe, and the like. And after that, there's a whole number of countries. Obviously, among them is Canada, uh, which supplies us with a lot of oil, especially into the Midwest, and has enormous reserves. Mexico's in there, and all of the OPEC nations. So By and large, what you've got, the three big dogs, if you want to call them that, are the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. And the two largest that are essentially tied are Iraq and Canada. And then after that, you have all kind of the OPEC countries that that are below that. So oil in the United States, where does the oil come from in the United States? Let's start with the largest states that are producers, and then let's go and talk about the imports that we do import, where are those imports coming from? But first, let's start with the, what are the biggest, largest oil producing states in the United States? Well, the largest states, and this switches around, but by far the number one state is Texas. Even though people said Texas didn't have any more oil, just, uh, well, President Obama said we can't drill our way to lower gas prices. I remember that because we didn't have it, well, we do. New technologies, new ways of doing things, new investments lead to that. So Texas is by far the number one producing state. California, interestingly enough, is one of the larger producers, but North Dakota is a major, major producer, which has changed the economy up there. So Texas, uh, roughly from the Energy Information Administration, which we'll put this, uh, this article up to, Texas produces 41% of our crude oil, and now in second place is North Dakota. And we've talked about North Dakota on the show before, Dan, but a little, uh, and and you were just about to get into it before I cut you off there. Can you explain to our listeners why North Dakota oil is different from Texas? And it's a different type of industry up there. Yes. Well, Texas has a long history of oil, and North Dakota has a long history of smaller oil operations. But Both of the changes are due to hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, but really what it's, it's because of horizontal drilling. We used to stick a straw down and try to suck out a part of a parfait. Now we turn the straw 
and take out the entire part of the parfait, and that's what's going on. And that's what made it possible before there were small amounts of oil in North Dakota, but because of the way the formation is in North Dakota, by being able to turn horizontally, and actually for our listeners, Dan and I actually went there back in, uh, gosh, what was that, Dan, about 2012. Uh, We went and we drove through, what is that called, the Bakken Field? Yes. Is that right? So we started in the, on the, uh, western side of North Dakota, and we drove all the way through North Dakota looking at that entire Bakken field and, and that industry. At that point, it was in full bloom by then, but I think what have they more than doubled what they were doing in 2012 to now oh, where they're the, the second, second largest producer of oil in the United States. So those run for about a mile, but before you could do the horizontal drilling with the hydraulic fracturing, that oil, you couldn't really get it even though it was down there. Yeah, the best analogy is a parfait, where you've got different layers of stuff. And if you're like me, I like to get to the chocolate, and that might be a thin layer in there. Before you stick your straw down and you'd suck around to to get that chocolate out of there, now you can turn the straw and follow it the way God laid it down, basically, because this is all organic material that was laid down millions and hundreds of millions of years ago. And all you're doing is tapping it consistent with the horizon as opposed to just a little touch. When you're sipping on your shake there, your ice cream shake, Dan, I hope you're not using a plastic straw because if you are, that would not be legal in many parts of the country now. I live in D.C. and they're not legal in D.C., so I have to go to Maryland in order to get a plastic straw. To buy, straw your, to buy your plastic them. straws? Yes. Okay. So Don't tell anyone. All right. So we've covered Texas, North Dakota. Then we go to New Mexico, Oklahoma, and even Colorado. There's still a lot of oil coming in off the Gulf, out in the uh, Gulf of uh, Mexico. So I guess a lot of that oil is in is both Texas and Louisiana. Is that right? Yes. It's in federal waters, government-owned waters, because a lot of it's deep. Uh, some of those wells are 200 miles offshore in U.S. waters. But that's actually a major contributor of our oil, about 2 million barrels a day. And, of course, there's Alaska, and Alaska oil is used predominantly on the West Coast. It's used in California and feeds refineries in Washington as well. So now let's get into today. Why, you know, why are we talking about oil this week? The reason why is it's for the first time uh, that I've seen in many, many years, the price of gas I actually saw for sale in California was actually below $2 in some places. And now you're seeing in parts of the United States, it's actually under a dollar, I was able to see. And people are celebrating this fact, but the truth is, uh, this is not a good sign for our economy or the global economy, because essentially what's happened is we've unplugged the economy entirely, and we have millions of jobs, people who work in the oil industry throughout the United States, who are now going to be out of a job until this oil glut is consumed off the market. So, Dan, can you walk us through the jobs and which which jobs are going to be most impacted? Yeah, the difference between now when we celebrate low oil prices now versus in the past is that in the past that was coming from foreign countries largely, and a lot of it came from the Middle East. We switched our suppliers. The number one supplier to the U.S. is Canada. But the U.S. is still a major producer, and that has produced hundreds of thousands, millions of jobs throughout the United States because it's not just the direct jobs that pay very, very well. A lot of these are six-figure jobs for someone uh, graduating from high school. They also are jobs in rural areas where people don't make nearly as much as they do in the big cities. And so... That money gets spread around. They spend it building houses and and, uh, buying things and propping up the local economies. And so wherever this happens, we've received the benefit of that. And it's been the leading, if you want to talk about the leading industry that has led us out of the 2008 recession, it's been oil and gas throughout the United States. That was leading the pack along with our production, which has increased because of these new technologies. And when those jobs go away, obviously people get hurt. And what's happened is because of a fight between Saudi Arabia and the Russians, they were flooding the world oil market. That dropped the price so low that it now, just like any other commodity, if it were beef or 
milk or anything else, if there's way too much of it on the market, people stop making it. And that's one of the challenges is that places I know like Libya and Saudi Arabia, the oil essentially sits right on top of the ground. And it's kind of what you were talking about earlier. You can just stick a straw down and it comes out. And I think a lot of those fields, Dan, are producing oil for three, four, five, six dollars a barrel. That's the cost of production, where the cost of production in North Dakota, West Texas, because of the hydraulic fracturing and having to drill horizontally, I think that price is somewhere around the $40 range. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, it depends on where it is, and obviously each well is different, but by and large, the costs of producing oil in the U.S. are much higher, in, in large part to the fact that we do it better than anybody else in the world. I mean, if you want to see the epitome of uh, modern environmental practices, you go to a modern oil and gas drilling, it's it's amazing. You could literally eat off the uh, the floors of the oil rigs out in the Gulf of Mexico. Right. So as we go forward now, we're looking at this the, the price. Now, obviously, when you buy oil from, whether it's coming from Canada or Mexico into the United States, or if you're bringing it in from the Middle East, you have a, a transportation cost involved in that. But still, in order for the price of gas needs to be somewhere in that $2 range kind of across the the country in order for all of the uh, jobs in the oil and gas sector to remain viable. That's right. And at that price, most consumers find that acceptable. In most families, the, the, I'll tell you one thing, they like it a lot better than $5 a gallon. And yeah. that's one of the big benefits we've had in our economy is lower energy prices because if you're spending that much less at the gas pump, it used to be five dollars. Well, now you're spending two. Yeah. Well, in uh, California, we still uh, we still brush up against five dollars, but that's for, for a whole bunch of other reasons that we covered on the show before. Um, yes. But but the bottom line here is, Dan, we've unplugged the economy completely, so you have a number that we're actually using. Well, why don't you tell me? Is it like half of the gasoline that we normally use? We're now using now over the last course of the last month. Yes, it was reported last week that we're down 48%. Think about that. Any business that loses 48% of its demand is going to be in tough shape, and that's what's happening. So essentially, we're all of our uh, reservoirs where we can store both crude oil, raw crude oil, and also refined product just filling up uh, everywhere across the United States. And so oil's coming out of the ground, but it's costing us a lot of money to store it, and so much so that we actually saw the price of oil go to zero you know, recently, earlier in this week. But Dan, something else has happened that you brought my attention to, and we'll close with this, and that is that it appears like there's a story out that we'll also we'll put on the screen about China, and that China went in here this week and bought a bunch of oil off of the market. What do you, what do you know about that? Well, I'm learning a lot more about it, but here's the story. It looks as though the Chinese were preparing last fall, even before the COVID became an issue worldwide, to expand their storage of oil, which, you know, had been cheaper, but it hadn't been uh, nearly as cheap. So they were building storage, and they were beginning to uh, make plans to uh, store away huge amounts of oil because... China to China uh, that imports a lot of oil, the price of oil is a large part of doing business, so they wanted to get on top of it. Now, all of a sudden, they've got their storage completed, the structures, and what they're doing is buying oil when it's worth almost nothing on the world market. And uh, it's a very curious story because it almost looks like they were anticipating this massive drop in oil prices that is beginning to hurt U.S. producers and causing all kinds of, of uh, concern wherever oil is produced in the world. So, so is there any evidence right now that they actually did go in this week and buy oil at very cheap prices? Oh, yeah. They're buying, <laughs> they're buying oil, all the oil that they can take. And the difference is they had planned for storage to be able to just do that. So maybe it's coincidence. Maybe not, but it's definitely something worth looking into, and I'm, I'm continuing to investigate it, Congressman. Well, Dan, the oil man, we'll have to have you back on when you figure this out about what China's up to. Yeah, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Well, we'll continue to, to monitor the situation. 
course, uh, right now, folks, if you can drive around and want to drive around, you can drive around cheap. Hopefully, we can all get out of our houses uh, soon and everybody can get back to work and we can uh, start to buy gas and visit our family and relatives and go on vacation and go to sporting events and everything else that we'd like to do. But until then, we'll stay on the watch. Dan Oilman, thank you so much. Dan Kish with the Institute for Energy Research. Thank you. And we will catch everyone next week. Thanks for listening to the Devin Nunes Podcast. We invite you to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And remember, you can download this podcast on iTunes or at DevinNunes.com. Storm clouds been gathering so long, I don't know. The darkness around us leaves no easy road. We started wondering if every road dead ends our dreams. It whips the dust up and rain's pouring down. Good people struggling in every hometown. We started wondering if we even matter at all. Trial by fire like this It's nothing hard working family can fix We've got the power to save it all here in our hands We'll take that hard road to happier days Cause we kept our American faith Paid for by Devin Nunes Campaign Committee.